There's a lot of, yeah, very, very seldom do they get it right. I saw this picture. It was like, what if horror games, like, um, like, sensed your sound? So if you were noisy. Yeah, there's Alien Isolation does that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Only play sims on your gaming channel. That's it. Okay, so let's go 3234. Okay, so the instructions are apply the mean value theorem. And find the values of C guaranteed. So, real quick, what is the mean value theorem? I guess we probably should review that. It's a, it's just a picture theorem, right? An existence theorem. What does it say? This is where we got cut off yesterday. Uh, if, if it's smooth. Uh, On a closed interval. Okay. Well, it's yeah. <laughs> okay. So, right. So it's saying that. If a function is smooth on a closed interval, A to B, then there exists at least one value, C, on the interior of the interval, where the slope of the secant line equals the slope of the tangent line. Right. So the picture that we draw just looks like this. Right. What are the coordinates of that point? This is y1, a, sorry, a, a, y1, a, f of a, f of a. F of a. Yeah. And the coordinates of this point then are e of b, b, y of b. And here is the secant line, right? And there's got to be at least one place, maybe multiple places, where the slope of the secant line and the tangent line are the same. So they're parallel, in other words, right? So then this becomes. Let's see. Does that make sense? Okay, we just have to find those. Okay? What is the. So if we meet the criteria, what is the slope of the secant line? Just rise over run, what's that going to be? F of A minus F of B over A of B. Or maybe back yeah, change in Y, F of B minus F of A over change yeah. in X, right? And that equals F prime of C, C right? Okay. So what about this problem? Is that function smooth every place on that interval? Yeah, guaranteed. They're sine functions, right? They're good. They're well behaved. So it is smooth every place, and so we've got to just go find the places then, right? Okay, so what do we what do we do? We've got to take a derivative, right? So f prime of x equals oh um, two cosine. Plus cosine two x. Right, by chain rule. Yeah. Okay. And so we're going to we want to find out when that derivative is equal to the slope of the secant line. Right. So let's figure out what is the slope of the secant line. So that's going to be f of zero b pi pi. Minus f of zero, zero over pi times zero. Pi minus zero. Good. So what is f of pi? So f of pi is going to be two times sine pi. I guess we probably need a unit circle, huh? So zero. What's the sine of pi? Zero. Zero. That's right there, isn't it? So the y value is zero, plus the sine of two pi. Zero. 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 Okay. So that's equal to 0 minus what's the sine of, what's 2 times the sine of 0? Zero? Zero, 0. Plus the sine of 2 times 0? Zero? 0. Math problems. So 
when the slope of the secant line is zero, right? So all we want to do then is find out where is the derivative for what values of x, and those will be our c's, right? Is the derivative equal to zero? Okay, so. Is that a zero to solve? Yeah, so the, right, so the calculus problem that we've got, or the algebra problem, is really this. Two cosine x plus two cosine two x equals zero. Okay, this is a good problem. There's some good trig going on here. How are we going to solve that? Divide by two. Okay, we could divide everything by two. That's good. Get rid of those guys. That's helpful. Now what? Yep. Can we make it two different? Okay, what's the problem with this equation? It's a double angle. Yeah, but the angles aren't the same. Like we got, it doesn't work. We've got to get the angles the same. So we need a trig identity. What's the cosine of 2x equal to? Cosine squared x minus sine squared x. There's three of them. There's three of them, yeah. No. Cosine. I was like, whoa, 2x. <laughs> so, <laughs> so sort of the parent form is going to be cosine squared minus sine squared, right? But we can use the Pythagorean trig identity to either write sine squares in terms of cosines or cosine squares in terms of sines if that's desirable. And it is here, right? Because we've got a cosine, we would rather have this written in terms of cosines. Everybody agree? So we're going to choose the one where we're going to let the sine squared equal the quantity 1 minus cosine squared, right? And then if we distribute the negative sign, we get 2 cosine squared minus 1, right? So that's one other version. But you can always just start there and derive the other versions, okay? So then we end up, if we make that substitution, we get cosine x plus the quantity 2 cosine squared x minus 1 equals 0. Okay, now what? You want to add 1 sine squared x? Mm, no. Move 1 to the other side? Mm -hmm. no. no. This is this is the part that's a little bit tricky. This is quadratic in what? So we just have to do that and then uh, it's, it's, it's not quadratic in terms of a variable x, right? It's quadratic in terms of the function cosine, cosine x, right? So we could write this as 2 times cosine x squared plus cosine x minus 1, whoops, minus 1 equals 0, right? And if you want to, you could even do something goofy like say, okay, let's go ahead and make a substitution. Let's let u equal cosine x, right? If we do that, you don't have to, it's sort of optional. But if you did, this would then look exactly like a normal quadratic function, wouldn't it? A quadratic equation, sorry. We'd get 2u squared plus u minus 1. You see the benefit of that? It just allows you to kind of see the different layers <coughs> separately because you've really got a, a quadratic equation in terms of the separate function cosine x, right? So what do you think we're going to do first here? What are, what are you going to do? Okay, we're going to factor it if we can. Right. If it factors, we'll do that. Uh, let's see. It does factor too, doesn't it? Okay. So we could write this. So we know that if it's going to factor easily, we're going to get a 2u and a u. And then we just need to find where's the negative 1 and the 1 go. Well, the positive must go opposite the 2u, right? That must be the plus 1, and that must be the minus 1 if it's going to foil properly. Everybody agree? Let's just try it. If we distribute, I'd get 2u squared plus 2u minus u. There's my u, right? And then minus 1. Okay? 
So we've got to solve this in turn. We've got to solve for you first, don't we? And what we're really solving for is then cosine x, right? Everybody see that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so then what are, what are our solutions? We end up with either u equals negative 1 or u equals 1 half. Okay, so then u is really cosine x, right? So we'll go back and we'll solve each of those for, for x individually, right? And our domain was just 0 to pi, correct? Yeah. So let's go to the next page. And we get the, get the solutions either cosine x equals negative 1 or cosine x equals 1 half. And remember that our domain is 0 to pi. Well, so right, so then we got to right. We need to find got a unit circle question, really, isn't it? So if we go to the unit circle, where is cosine equal to negative one? Oh, at pi. At pi, but <coughs> pi. And, and remember that the mean value theorem guarantees value of values of c on the interior, the open interval, right? So pi doesn't work for us, does it? Pi is not a value guaranteed by the mean value theorem. Right. The solution here is three, three over two. x equals pi, but that is not in the open zero interval to zero to pi, right? So we can cross that one out. Agreed? Okay, what about cosine x equals one half? Where does cosine x equal one half? Three, 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 three. So that's going to be, well, where is that going to be? Three over two, right? There, there's the line, x equals 1 half, right? No. Right? Right? Cosine equals 1 half where? That's going to be the small value. Isn't that root 3 over 2? That's what I said. No, root 3, no. No, you're, it, we're looking for an angle. Right. Oh, so it's pi over four. Sixty. Yeah. So yeah, no. sixty degrees. Oh. Sixty degrees. Yeah. 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 Not forty-five. Oh. Right. So that's going to be at the point. The point where this happens up here is going to be the point with coordinates y coordinate. Oh, sorry. X coordinate one half. Right. What's the y coordinate going to be that goes with root that? Root three over two. Yeah. Root three over yeah. two. Right. Okay. So yeah. I was on the right track. Okay, but we're not looking for that. We're yeah. looking for the angle. Right? Then the other one would be down here, but we're only looking on the interval from there over to there, right? Zero to pi. So that's the only one we get. What's that angle in radians? Pi thirds. Yeah, that happens at pi thirds. So the solution is x equals pi thirds. So we only get one answer, and it's pi thirds. Okay? Make sense? Do you record this? Yeah. I am recording. Yeah, yeah. Okay. What about I want to do number? I want to do this one. Okay, so now we're doing 3.3 and 3.4 combined. Okay, 3.3 is first derivative test and increasing decreasing intervals. 3.4 parallel to that is second derivative test, concavity, right? Intervals were concave up and concave down. So here's the problem we're going to look at. Okay. I want to find Let's start off by just doing 3.3 stuff. So let's find relative extrema and increasing and decreasing intervals using our table. Okay? So this would be 6 pi squared plus 6 pi. 6x squared? Sorry, 6x. Okay, so we'll, so we'll take a derivative, right? We're going to need the first derivative. So everybody agrees that's just going to be 6x squared minus 6x minus 12. 
Okay? And so if we set that equal to zero, we can trade that for an easier equation, can't we? We could trade that for the equation. If I divide both sides through by six, we could trade that for the equation x squared. Come on, what's I doing? X squared minus x minus two equals zero. Right? Okay. Uh, let's go ahead and find all our first derivative critical numbers. Okay. Is this, where do critical numbers exist? Zero or undefined. Where the derivative is zero or undefined. Is this derivative ever going to be undefined? No. It's not, is it? Right? Uh, it's a polynomial, it's well behaved, so we get no, none of those kinds of derivatives. What kinds of features could those derivatives, the, those kinds of critical numbers give us where the first derivative is undefined? If they, if we had critical numbers and they panned out, what kinds of peaks and valleys would we get from that? Where we had undefined derivatives. Where are derivatives undefined? Sure. Ah, sharp corners, right? So we would have had sharp peaks and, and sharp valleys, right? Okay, so we don't get any of those though, right? Uh, where is this equal to zero? Well, let's find out. Does that factor? Yes. Yeah, it does. I get what, x minus two, x plus 1, so my critical numbers are x equals 2 or x equals 1? Negative, negative 1. Negative, sorry, negative 1, right? <coughs> okay, so let's go ahead and make our table. So, What's our domain? All reals, right? So then that's going to look like this. Okay, that's telling us our domain is all reals. Questions on that? Does that make sense? Okay. And let's see, we had critical numbers at negative 1 and positive 2. And those were both places where the first derivative is equal to zero, right? So how are we going to know, relying on the first derivative only, whether those are extrema or not? Okay, we've got to use test points, right? So let's pick some good test points. What's 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 one probably great test point? Zero. 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 Yeah. Okay. Another one over here. I don't know. What do you say? Negative two. Yeah. That up here. Who cares? Right? Oh, number bigger. So all we want to do here, though, remember, we don't need to be very specific. All we're trying to do is determine what is the sign of the first derivative at these places. Okay. But what's the sign going to be at zero? Positive. Negative. Negative. Right. So I'm going to get a negative there. What about at negative two? What are we going to get? So at negative two, we're going to get six times four is twenty-four plus 12, it's clearly positive, isn't it? Right. What about at 4? At 4, we're going to get positive also. That first term's going to be really big, but positive, right? Okay, so that tells us a lot. Then from section 3.3, we, we can tell a lot of things here. We can tell, what is this, for example, right here? What, what's a positive first derivative mean? on that interval, for all values less than x equals negative 1, what's going on with the function? It is, is it, what's it again? Yeah. Oh, it is a peak, right. That means that this is an increasing interval, doesn't it? Right. And this is going to be a decreasing interval. And so what's that look like? If we go from increasing to decreasing, doesn't that look like that? We agree? And we put that there to indicate that it's a horizontal asymptote, right? It equals zero. So that means it's a smooth peak on that thing, right? What about this guy, though? Smooth. Smooth valley, right? And if we had to write, so if we wanted, we could find the coordinates of, of the y coordinates by just plugging back into f, no big deal, right? So let's do that. What's the other half of that ordered pair? If I evaluate my original function at negative 1, I get negative 2 minus 3 plus 12, right? 
So seven. Yeah, right. I think so. Okay. Yeah. What about at two? So at two, we're going to get 16 minus 12 is 4. 4 minus 24 is negative 20. Did I, I hope I did that right. Did I do that right? Okay. Okay. And then if we wanted to write the intervals on which it's increasing and decreasing, we could say that f is increasing on what intervals? Interval or intervals? Negative infinity. Negative two. Negative infinity to negative one, right? Or two to infinity. Two to infinity. In other words, x is less than negative 1 or x is greater than positive 2, right? And we could say the function is decreasing on what single interval? Sorry. Yeah, x is greater than negative 1 and less than 2. Okay, good. Okay, let's go one step further. Let's advance up to section 3-4. And let's now answer the question, OK, we want to know in addition to all the relative extrema which we located in the intervals on which it's increasing and decreasing, let's also add to that points of inflection and intervals where the concavity is up versus down. Okay, So what are we going to have to do there? What do we do to find points of inflection? Second derivative. OK, so we've got to go one step further with this. And the second derivative is what? 12x minus 6. Okay? So that's nowhere undefined, right? But where is the second derivative equal to 0? At 1 half, set that equal to 0 and solve. Very great. Okay? So then we need to add, we get an additional point here. Let's go ahead. I'm just going to get rid of these guys for a second. Well, I guess we can leave that one. One half falls in there, right? Okay, and that's a place we now need. Another row. For our second derivative. And we found out that that was 0 there. Right? OK, so now I want you to remind me of the relationship here. We know that a, a relative extremum is a transitional point for the sign of the first derivative, right? OK, agree? We go from increasing to decreasing or vice versa, either sharp corner or, or flat top, right, or smooth top. What is a point of inflection? We were talking about this right before break. It starts decreasing the slope. Say it again. Right when it starts decreasing the slope. Oh, okay, yeah. right. So it's going to be it's going to be a point of transition of the second derivative, which means a point of transition of concavity, right? We probably need to spend a little time talking about concavity, too. Let's, let's remind ourselves of the business model one, right? Well, yeah, I mean, we could, we could do that, or we could even, I'm not even so concerned about that at the moment. I just want to know, before we go any further with this, I want everybody to have a clear idea of what positive versus negative concavity means. So if I have a function like that, for example, if it, is, if it has a positive concavity, that's what we call concave up. What is that? How do we know when, a, at a given point, the concavity of a function is positive? So if I want to know, for example, at this point right here, what's the concavity? What could I do? Uh, just the two points next to it? Well, I mean, yeah, not what I'm looking for. I mean, you, yeah, but we want to be able to do it visually. What's it's it mean? You tell me, is it concave up or concave down? It's concave up. You can see that kind of, can't you? Yeah. Here's the test. If we draw a tangent to the curve there, remember this test? 
if the curve sits on top of the tangent, oh, it must right. be concave up, positive concavity, right? Does that make sense? Up here, it would clearly be what? Negative. Negative, because now the curve is sitting below the tangent, right? And so it's got to be concave down. Well, what's happening at this point right about there? An inflex. That's the place of transition, isn't it? From being above the tangent line to below the tangent line, right? So that's what we call what? What kind of point? In, yeah, inflection point, right? Okay. So then if we go back to our, our drawing here, this is where we're probably not going to get much further with this, but one thing I want to get to, I just need to test to see if the concavity is changing, right? Agree? But to do that, why not kill two birds with one stone? Why not test the concavity here, right? Let's test it at my first derivative critical number. So if I go up to my first or my second derivative and I test the sine of the second derivative at negative 1, what do I get? Negative. negative. So it's concave down. Well, let's just focus on that column for a second. If I have a, let's think about how we add these things up. If I've got a horizontal tangent line and a downward concavity, what's that mean? That's peak. That's a peak, yeah. right? That's got to be a smooth peak, right? You get that? Now let's check right here. If I evaluate the sine of the second derivative at 2, would you agree that we're going to get positive? Okay, so then think about that now. Look at this column. If I get, once again, a 0 first derivative, means horizontal tangent, and a positive concavity, that's concave up, that means a smooth valley, doesn't it? And look, look what we did there. This is also an inflection point, because we're going from downward concavity to upward concavity. So look at all the stuff we did with that. It's too simple. That's pretty good. That tells us everything, too, by the way, doesn't it? Because wouldn't you agree that if that if this is a this is downward concavity here, then to the left of this function, it's got to be, the slope has to be increasing everywhere, right? So you know right away then that that's positive. You could fill that in after the fact without even checking a test point there, right? And you know that between here and here where you're going, if you're to the left of a peak and the right of a valley, that would tell you that it's a decreasing function in there, right? And then to the right of the valley, that would tell us that I could put my plus sign there without even having to use, see the point here, see what's great about this is I don't even need these dumb test points anymore. How many test points did I use? Well, I only used two of them, and they were really good test points because it, it did everything for me. Right? So remember I told you guys before the break that it really pays to work as far down the table as you can? Look at all, we, look at all the stuff that we got from just those two wimpy little test points. Right? So would we be able to just completely skip the first derivative, effectively? You, well, no, because you need to know where the first derivative has critical numbers. Oh, right. yeah. okay. But we don't have to get the test points. So I did put up the 3.4 assignment. So you can you can start on that stuff too. We'll, we'll spend a little more time on that, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. yeah.